All right, what do you got? All right, Matthew 24, 9 through 11. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. Mm -hmm. Now, who is Jesus talking about? Who is being talked about here? So, in Matthew 24, the Bible says, verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so there are people who believe that that happened in 70 A.D. You might even have a footnote in your Bible that says that Titus did that. Titus was a Roman general. Vespasian had, um, had begun the siege of Jerusalem. When Nero died... There were Otho and Velba and uh, three and another man, and in short periods they were emperors following Nero, but uh, Vespasian knew that he could be the emperor, so he immediately started heading back for Rome. And Titus finished that siege and sacked Jerusalem in 70 A.D. The only problem is you can go there and see stones on top of another. You know, if you go into the, the how many of you ever seen the Wailing Wall? Those stones are on top of each other. And you can there's it's called the Kotel Tunnel. The Kotel is the name for the Jewish name for that wall. And you go to the Kotel Tunnel. It's a tunnel that goes underneath that wall. And there's you see these huge, amazing stones that are still there. So that can't be the fulfillment of this prophecy because those stones are there. And this is a pretty detailed prophecy, isn't it, on on those stones? So that's not what it's talking about. And so verse three. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying. Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? All right, so it's coming, and of the end of the world. And so then Jesus answers them, and what he goes into is the tribulation period. And the reason I know that it's the tribulation period is because in verse 29 it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So the, the Bible tells us the period of time that this is dealing with. And it's the tribulation period. We also, when you look at um, verse 13, and he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. People teach that that's um, salvation in the sense of uh, being born again. No, it's that you're going to be alive to go into the kingdom. And this gospel, what's it say? Of the kingdom. So that's how I know that that's saying that you're going to be able to go into the kingdom. Do you see how complicated that is. It's because people, they, they bring other ideas to the text, just the simple reading of the text clears it up so much. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, that abomination of desolation, the Bible says, it takes place in the middle of a week of years. So it's seven years. In the middle of a seven-year period, the abomination of desolation takes place. And that's when the Antichrist... So the temple has been rebuilt, and the Antichrist defiles the, holy, the holiest of all. And so that, that's what's described. And so when he does that, he's saying, get out of there, because the second half of the tribulation is going to be worse than anything that's ever happened. Verse 16, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Now you see that those days. Anytime you see those days, look for the tribulation period. And the definer for that is verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of what? Those days. All right. But pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no nor ever shall be. So you have the tribulation is the first three and a half years, and the great tribulation is the second three and a half years. And except those days, do you see those days? What should you look for when you see those days? Tribulation, tribulation period. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake... Those days shall be shortened. The elect is the Jews. It's Israel. And he shortens those days. Look at uh, 
keep your place there, but go to Revelation chapter 6. No, Revelation chapter 8, I believe. Verse 12, Revelation 8, 12. Okay, Revelation 8, 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So the part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So in Matthew chapter 24, it says that during the tribulation period, the days are going to be shortened. Revelation chapter 8, it says that they're shortened by a third. How about that? And what's so interesting about that, the, the Bible is so detailed. I've shown you this passage before, but look at it in this context. Look at Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah 13, look at verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, Two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. So he shortens it by a third, so that a third of them live. Isn't that amazing? Do you think that's a coincidence? Sure. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So back to Matthew chapter 24. Um, so it says, And except those days, verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. There's repetition in there, isn't there? And repetition is God's volume control. Go to Isaiah 45. And look at verse 4. Let's see if we can prove that that is because of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. He's talking about King Cyrus. He raised up Cyrus to, to protect Israel. But Israel mine elect. So when you look at uh, Matthew chapter 24, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. It's for Israel, so Israel can live through it. Look at verse 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall so show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, uh, there will the eagles be gathered together. And then he, his appearing takes place. Verse 30, Then shall, what's that word? Appear. See, that's why we call it the appearing. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory with power and great glory. Go back to um, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9. And it shall come to pass, what are those next three words? Does that tell us anything? In that day, that's the day that Jesus Christ comes back to establish His kingdom. That day. Um, and just for the, the, what's really fun is, um, this all just ties in with my lesson tonight. It's just exactly where we are. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, 
and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem. All right, so go back to Matthew chapter 24. All right, so look at verse 29 again. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the sun and, and stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together, look at this, his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. And so now he goes into a parable, and we'll get to that parable later. But what's happening here is this is all dealing with the nation of Israel and how he's going to gather them together after the tribulation period. Um, Mormon theology using this to, do, to have anything to do with Joseph Smith it's completely destroying the context. Um, Acts 3, 19, 21. The other two, I already read through them. I can already answer those. Okay, so look at verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So that what the what all the holy prophets have spoken of is the day that Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth to establish his kingdom. They've all prophesied about that day. That's, that's what all the holy prophets have prophesied about, is the day that Jesus Christ is going to return to establish, establish his kingdom. Um, look at what it says in verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham and thy seed and all the... Uh, uh, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So this whole, t the times of restitution that come from the Lord, that's because the world's been destroyed in the tribulation period. So it has to be restored. So look at Second Chronicles 7.14. Second Chronicles. 714. If my people, now who are his people? Yeah. Right? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Alright? He needs to heal their land because he has destroyed it. Um, look at Revelation chapter 6. I believe it's verse 15. Look at verse 15. Um, well, this, this perfectly ties in with Matthew 24, verse 12. And so... This is Revelation 6.12. This ties in with Matthew 24.29. Um, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as hair, and uh, as, uh, became as black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree 
casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains, Fall on us, and hide us from what? The face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? So for the next couple of chapters, going through chapter 9, Jesus is literally destroying the world. All the green grass, third of the moon, third of the sun, third of the stars, the fish in the sea are dead, the cattle on the earth are dead. He's just destroying every bit of it. And what's interesting is that it perfectly correlates to his creation. When he created the trees, and he created the, the fish, and he created the cattle, and he created the stars. The, everything that is destroyed in the tribulation it's all the stuff that he created, but they wouldn't acknowledge him as the creator. So he's taking his creation back. That's what he does. And so in that Second Chronicles 7.14, he says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and seek my face. Here they're still hiding from his face. When you look at chapter 9, Verse 18, By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Drop down to verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, neither, uh, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their fornications, or nor of the fornication nor of their thefts. And so he's, he's destroying the world. People won't repent that Zechariah. Go back to that Zechariah 13. This is the cross-reference to 2 Chronicles 7.14. So remember verse 9, Zechariah 13.9, I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. Now look at, they shall call on my name, if my people, which are called by my name, right? I will hear them, I will say it is my people, and they shall say the Lord is my God. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. And so, that, that day of the Lord, that day, that's the day that all the holy prophets prophesied on, that day of the restitution of all things, because he's destroyed it all. Go to Psalm 67. You find this all through the Old Testament. Psalm 67. Remember, Second Chronicles 7.14, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, Right? Seek my face. Remember in Revelation, they're hiding from his face. Psalm 67, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. You see that? Cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. Now that Selah is always referring to the millennium, the kingdom. That thy way may be known upon earth. Look at this. Thy saving health among all nations. Why? Everybody's dying. Because of the tribulation. Everybody's dying. Let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously. So Jesus Christ comes back, and this is actually our lesson tonight, is looking at that, how he judges, um, to explain the next parable. It says, uh, O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Selah. He's not doing that right now, right? Let, all, let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee. Verse 6, Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall love Him. All the ends of the earth shall worship Him. No, they're going to fear Him. <laughs> they're going to fear Him. Why? Because of the wrath, the great day of the wrath of the Lamb. So the restitution of all things is when everything goes back to the way that it had been intended to be at the creation. 
So the earth has been destroyed in the tribulation, and now God restores it. He heals the land. Um, so that's the, that's the Acts chapter 3. The restitution of all things is when he restores the earth after having destroyed it in the tribulation. Okay. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 13. All right, Matthew chapter 13, we've been looking at the parables. I'm not going to do any of the introduction that we've been doing. Um, so let's just dive into it. Look with me at verse 24. So he's just finished the parable of the sower, and he's just finished explaining the parable of the sower. He, he does the parable. And then he gives his explanation, of, or then he explains why he speaks in parables, and then he goes into the explanation of the parable of the sower. And right from that, he goes into verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Now, so tares and wheat, they, are, they look very much the same when they're growing. But when the, the wheat uh, buds... There's a, there's a kernel in the flower, and that's the wheat. The tares don't have the kernel. So it looks just like, it looks just the same, but it doesn't have the, the, the fruit. When I was in Israel, um, I think it was in Nazareth, we went to a threshing floor, and they, I brought home, it's in my office somewhere, a tear. It, it looks just like wheat. It just doesn't have what you would uh, be able to use from it, so it's worthless. Um, now, it's not a weed. It's not a weed because it's something that's planted, and it's, it's, it's a different thing. So, once then, at the end of verse 27, hath it tares. And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of reapers, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, this is one of those parables that has been so misused, you know, you're going to have unbelievers in the church. This doesn't have anything to do with the church. It, it's, it says, the king, verse 24, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. So what God is saying in this text is that in the millennium, in the kingdom, there's going to be, there's going to be lost folks in the kingdom. It, it can also apply to the tribulation. That in the tribulation, there are going to be people that are pretending to be true, but they're not true. They're not real. And so let me show you... Um, Go to the book of James. How many of you know that people really struggle to understand the books of Hebrews and James? There's a lot of, there's a lot of doctrinal error that comes from false teaching out of the books of Hebrews and James. And Hebrews and James, it, it's interesting... This is really a deep question. Now, again, you guys don't have my level of Bible college education, so you might not be able to answer this. Who's the book of Hebrews written to? Hebrews. Hebrews. <laughs> it's complicated, isn't it? So it's just different. Those Hebrews, they were people that were living in the shadow. They were, they were Christians, first century Christians, living in the shadow of the temple. And the temple was the center of their, of their civil their social and their religious life. And so people kept trying to mix that Judaism in with Christianity and the whole book of Hebrews is written to those Hebrew Christians saying, go on in the faith, go on in the faith, don't stop. Now let me ask you a question. When the tribulation period happens and the Christians have been taken out and the gospel of the kingdom is being preached, 
and these people are believing. Now the temple's been rebuilt, and the temple is again the center of their civic, social, and religious life. Do you think the book of Hebrews is going to be important to people in the tribulation period? Now look at James. Look at James 1, verse 1. And God put these books in your Bible in this order for a reason. So look at the book of James, verse 1. James, a servant of Christ and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to who? The twelve tribes, which are scattered abroad, greeting. So who's the book of James addressed to? The twelve tribes scattered abroad. How many of you are from the twelve tribes scattered abroad? Whose mail are you reading? Remember that question. It's always really important. Um, so look at... See, again, so the twelve tribes scattered abroad in the tribulation period. Look at verse 2. See if this is interesting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any, man, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. For a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Man, when you start looking through this, this passage, um, let's just read on. Verse 9, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the, gra and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So shall the rich man fade away in his ways. What happens in the tribulation? All the green grass is gone. Everything is gone. Do you, do you see the connections with it? And when you read the book of James, you'll see it. And, and it talks about patience in tribulation. It talks about keep your mouth shut. Do you think in the tribulation period it's going to be important to keep your mouth shut? How about making sure that your life matches what you profess? So if you're around someone, they claim to be a believer, and their life doesn't match what they profess, you got to get away from that person, because that person is going to get you killed. When you read the book of James with that tribulation context, it just opens up truth in the book of James that's so important. Now, let me be very clear. There are people there called hyper-dispensationalists. What they say is that Hebrews and James aren't for us at all. We don't even need to read them. But the Bible says all Scripture is given by, by inspiration of God and is profitable. So, is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways? Yeah. Yeah, are you supposed to be patient in trouble? Yes. So all of this applies because it was written to Christians, Jewish Christians. But understand that in the tribulation, all of these things are going to become very, very important. So you're going to have these tares and wheat in the tribulation, but you're also going to have the tares and wheat in the kingdom. Uh, so what I wanted to do tonight... Before we get into the exposition of the parable, and Jesus will give an explanation of the parable, but I think one of the reasons that people struggle so much with a parable like this, most Christians have a complete misunderstanding of what the whole kingdom is about, what the whole millennium is about. So, let's see, what time is it? All right, so let me see if just in the next few minutes, before we're done tonight if we can have a better understanding for the purpose of the millennium, the purpose of the millennium. If you look at verse 24 of Matthew 13, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that soweth good seed in his field. So this kingdom of heaven, it's, it's going to be like that. Look at verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hidden three measures of a meal. And he goes on and, and he describes all of these things, then he gives an explanation. And The reason that people struggle so much with understanding these parables is because they don't know the purpose of the millennium. So let's look at it. Um, you don't have to keep Matthew 13. I don't think we're going to be back there tonight in the little bit of time that we have. But go with me to Revelation chapter 20.
look at verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon, or, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired... So what's the theme of this text? The thousand years. Now some of you didn't answer that and I think maybe it's because you fell asleep. But... Um, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right, and then it goes on to the great white throne judgment. So this explains that you're going to have this thousand year period of time where Satan has been bound and, and Jesus Christ is going to reign. But not only that, but they're going to be people ruling and reigning with Christ. So let's look at the, the purpose of the millennium from different perspectives. So the purpose of the millennium from the Father's perspective, from God the Father's perspective, is it's the public honoring of His Son. It's the public honoring of Jesus Christ. Because God the Father did not like the humiliation that His Son has endured. And it's the fulfillment of all of His promises. It's the final trial of sinful men. When I say it's the final trial of sinful men, imagine this. You know, there are a lot of people that don't like Christianity because God's unjust. How many of you ever heard somebody say that? Right? You have atheists. They, they don't like it because God's unjust. Well, Jesus Christ himself rules and reigns with a rod of iron, and justice is swift. It is completely swift. That's when we looked at the turn the other cheek passage. You don't have to hit somebody back. Jesus Christ is going to take care of it. Right? And so it's important. And then it's the restoration of God's original intent in the Garden of Eden. That's the restitution of all things, Caleb. It's the, it's the restitution. It's the restoration of what God had intended. Then, so that's, that's the kingdom from the Father's perspective. From the Son's perspective, from Jesus Christ's perspective, it's the kingdom that He has awaited. So look at Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 12. The Bible says, But this man... After he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting. Do you see that? Expecting? You might want to mark that word. Expecting. Till his enemies be made his footstool. What's Jesus Christ waiting for? What's he expecting? His enemies to be his footstool. He's going to put his feet on them. That's what Jesus thinks of those people. All right, That's the kingdom. Understand, that's the kingdom from Jesus Christ's perspective. This wimpy Jesus that's put out by the world, he is simply not the Jesus of the Bible. He is seated in anticipation of what awaits him. He will sit upon the throne at Jerusalem. And then not only that, but it's also the establishment of his righteousness. Look at Isaiah, I'm sorry, uh, Psalm chapter 45. This passage is quoted in Hebrews, but it's, there's more information here. Psalm 45, look at verse 6. Thy throne, O God, and remember, this is what the Father says to the Son. 
Uh, we have to look at it. Go to Hebrews. Keep keep Isaiah. Go to Hebrews uh, one. Verse 8. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Do you see that? So back to Isaiah, I'm sorry, Psalm 45. Verse 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. This kingdom that he establishes will be a kingdom of righteousness. Um, let me say this. See there in verse 7, thou lovest righteousness. And what does it say? Hatest wickedness. Hate wickedness. Folks, we need to hate wickedness. You know... You guys know, I hope everybody here knows that I am an anti-legalist pastor. I think legalism destroys people's Christianity. But that doesn't mean we love wickedness. Right? That's right. Let's, let's us hate the wickedness that's in the world. I, I could stop there, but we need to go on. Um, look with me at, I think it's Matthew. Yeah, go to Matthew chapter 6. From the kingdom, from the son's perspective. The, the kingdom will be an answer to Jesus Christ's prayer. Anyone ever seen this verse? Verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. When Jesus Christ comes and establishes His kingdom, God's will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's, that's from the Son's perspective. It's also His reward. Not only is it His answer to prayer, but it's His reward to the meek. Look at chapter 5, Matthew 5 and verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's a blessing to the meek. Look at Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. So here's what, these two verses, you need to have those cross-referenced together. The meek shall inherit the earth, but here this the violent are trying to take the kingdom. They're not going to get it. The meek are going to get the kingdom. The violent, those who are trying to take it by force, they're not going to get it. You cannot establish God's righteousness on this earth by your military. You can't do it. Only Jesus can. And so the meek, that's talking about the Jews in the tribulation or in the millennium. But um, once the strong man takes all the violent ones and forces them into submission, then we're going to have peace on earth. That's what people think. But Satan is the strong man, and what he does, look at Revelation chapter 6. Verse 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So he conquers with peace. He has a bow, but no arrows. Look at verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So he comes and, and brings peace, but it's not real peace. And people end up with, with horrible death and destruction. Jesus Christ understood that. He said that the meek shall inherit the earth. Don't follow the Antichrist. Um, then, so that's that's... You know the kingdom from Jesus Christ's perspective, and it's not even close to all of it. But let's look at it from the church's perspective. All of our troubles are over. All of our troubles are over. You know, Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign with righteousness, and it's a rod of iron. And we're going to see some passages where it's rough, man. His rule is rough. And someone might say, that's not fair. Well, whose side are you on? 
See, we're going to, ready for this? We're going to be sinless. So we're going to love His righteous kingdom. The people that go into the kingdom, these tares, the people that go into the kingdom, they're, sa they're, they're alive, they're saved alive through the kingdom, and they belong to nations that didn't come against Israel, but they're coming into the kingdom, and th some of them choose to follow Christ, some of them don't. But they sure don't talk about it. They look just like anyone else in the kingdom. But when Satan is loose, they follow Satan. That's what happens in the millennium. All right, so let's go on. But for us, our troubles are over. Look at 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear... Now, remember that appearing, right? When He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself, even as He is pure. Man, it's all going to be visible, observable. And then we'll receive our rewards. We're going to rule and reign with Christ. Look at 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, and look at verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. So if we believe in Him, even if we suffer, we are going to reign with Him. Look at Revelation you know, we looked at it already. Just for time's sake, we won't go there. It says that those who who suffer through the tribulation are going to reign with uh, Christ. Then, from the perspective of the Gentile nations, look at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Look at verse 15. This whole passage is amazing. Look at... Uh, Look at verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Remember the white horse there in Revelation 6? That's the deceiver. That's the imposter. Here's the real thing. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Did anybody get goosebumps reading that? My goodness. Can you? We can't imagine what that's going to look like when he comes. But from the perspective of the Gentile nations, it is going to be horrible judgment. Um, so, what's going to happen in the kingdom is the choice is going to be righteousness or hell? Those are your two choices. Righteousness or hell. That's what you're going to get. Um, it will be worldwide peace. There's not going to be any more war after the millennium. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 2. Look at verse 3. Well, let's start reading in verse 1. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. So I believe that the nation of Israel, that at the nation of Israel, that, that Jerusalem is going to be raised up higher than the rest of the mountains. I think that's what this text is saying. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, 
and he will teach of his uh, teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he shall judge and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war any more here's why because in Revelation chapter 20, when they rise up against him, God destroys them with fire out of heaven. There's no battle. No need for weapons anymore. Ready for this? Turn the other cheek. That's the purpose of that. So in the, from the perspective of the Gentile nations that survive the judgment, they'll be ruled with a rod of iron. There's not going to be any more war. And the yearly worship will be of the king at Jerusalem. There's no more Mecca. There's no more Rome. There's no more false religion. Then from Israel's perspective, all of their enemies have gone and the kingdom promises are realized. From creation's perspective, all that has been subject to vanity is ended. The Bible says that, that now even the creation groans. Romans chapter 8. Look at that with me. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestations of the sons of God. Remember that from 1 John 3? We don't know yet what we're going to appear. For the creature is made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So even creation is groaning, waiting for this restoration of the world. It's the regeneration of land, water, plants, air, everything. Um, you know what? Next week we'll finish that, the millennial order, and then we'll, we'll roll into it. But isn't that interesting, looking at what, what the kingdom is really about? We always know that it's a thousand years, but there's so much more to it. And what the parables are doing, those kingdom parables, they're teaching what that kingdom is going to be like. And if you start applying it to the church, you miss what all the holy prophets have prophesied. It's all about that day. Okay? Thanks, everybody.